Good evening, everybody. I want to welcome you uh, to Greater Hope Church. Uh, we're back as in the olden days uh, here at Mulberry High School Auditorium. It's been a few years since we've met here, uh, but y'all, so most of y'all remember back to the days that we were here. Uh, it is a little warmer than it used to be in here. <laughs> uh, we have been working on the air all afternoon, but uh, it is what it is right now. So these right here, I see some of y'all have already gotten a picture. They double as fans. So, and hopefully uh, it will continue to get cooler as we, as we sit together. Uh, tonight is a very special day, and I've been saying you know, it's a big day in all caps. You know, tonight uh, represents so much um, hard work, but it, it more than anything represents so much of the work of God. Uh, and I know that as I look out here, I can, I can hardly see it through the lights, but those of you who I can see, I know the stories uh, and the ways that the gospel has impacted your life uh, and greater hope, and my heart is full tonight. Uh, my heart is fuller uh, than I could have possibly imagined, and I have been imagining this day for a long time. And so thanks for being here with us. Uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, if you look in your bulletin, there's a couple of um, announcements there, just uh, housekeeping items. There are uh, some restrooms in the lobby. Uh, the man's is on your right-hand side, and the female uh, restroom is on your left-hand side, uh, right in the back of the lobby. Uh, we are going to have light refreshments served after the service. You can get them in the lobby and, and go outside onto the porch and enjoy them there if you'd like as well. Uh, I want to thank a few people in particular, a few groups of people. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all the members and regular attenders of Greater Hope Church, both present and past. Amazing. Uh, you know, one of the great highlights of, of my night tonight is being able to do this and worship among friends. Uh, and you truly are friends. I want to thank also all the members, elders, and deacons of Trinity Presbyterian Church, uh, a church that I was a part of for 12, 13 years uh, before we launched out. And I was, I was on staff there, so most of you all know that. And I'm very grateful to everybody, uh, including uh, Pastor Tim Rice, who is a dear mentor of mine. Uh, he cannot be here tonight because his son is graduating from Yale with his Ph.D., so that's, I think that's a good excuse, right? Um, his son is very smart, and his name is Tyler. Pray for him. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the members of Southwest Florida Presbytery. Uh, everybody who's here, we have a commission of uh, elders and pastors here uh, to help us ordain. Thanks, guys, for coming out. And I also want to thank the Renew Bolt Church Planning Network. Uh, it's so good to be a part of this network, and I can't wait to continue to be a part of it for years to come. And thanks also to the Florida Church Planning Network, uh, all of which are represented in different ways uh, in the room tonight. And so, are y'all ready to worship God? If you would please stand. Uh, we're going to start by seeing the doxology. You can find all the words tonight printed in the bulletin. Let's sing together. Praise God for whom all blessings flow.
in the one who has opened up your hand and filled us with new things. God, thank you for the many blessings that you have given to this church. God, thank you for greater hope. The way that you brought us from just an idea to infancy to our toddler state at this point. God, we give you thanks. We praise you also today because of who you are, Lord. You are consistent in every one of your ways. And that's the reason why, God, we want to gather in your presence tonight to mark this day. That's the reason why we want to call upon you in prayer, asking you to be with the men who are going to be set apart as officers of the church. Because we know that ultimately everything we do depends on the God who changes not. God, thank you for your consistency. Tonight as we sit in your presence, God, we are aware of how far short of your glory we fall. God, we confess tonight that we have been often too cold towards you. We've been often remiss to count up the blessings that you've bestowed on us. Or we have often not uh, sounded the amen that your people so rightfully should sound. And so, God, I pray tonight that you would forgive us. That you would have mercy upon us. Meet us here and make this place a house of prayer. Make this place tonight a house of your presence. And, Lord God, continue to grow our church for years to come. We pray it in Christ's name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, if your faith is in Christ, please hear the good news uh, today from Luke chapter 15. These are the words of Jesus himself, who said, There is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, let's reason this way. If there's joy in heaven from God over one sinner repenting, how much joy is there over a whole church of repentant sinners? I believe God rejoices tonight over what he sees here. Amen. Uh, please hear in that uh, light the first scripture reading tonight, 2 Chronicles. Uh, Solomon built the temple of God, and when he had prayed to dedicate it, something amazing happened. God showed up among his people. Can you imagine? God actually showed up in church. Uh, sometimes he's the last person we expect to meet here. And yet, uh, he is he's so eager to meet with his people and to show us his great power. So please hear God's word again. Now, oh my God, let your eyes be opened and your ears attentive to the prayer of this place. And now arise, O Lord God, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation, and let your saints rejoice in your goodness. O Lord God, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. Remember your steadfast love for David, your servant. And as soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house because of the Lord, because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement, and they worshipped. And gave thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Hold that on earth to do it.
battle for us. Uh, Lord, tonight our cup runs over as we think of all the blessings that you have given. Uh, we think of the changed lives, Lord. We think and give you praise for the ways, even small ways, that we've repented together. Uh, small ways, oh Lord, that, that we have believed just a little bit more in Jesus than we did the day before. Ways that we've encouraged one another uh, through these first uh, four years or so. And God, we give you thanks for every bit of it. We thank you for when you met us, even in low times and dark times uh, in the history of our church. Times when our congregation was heartbroken and troubled, Lord. You came to us and you cared for us and made us to lie down and led us beside the still waters. Tonight, oh God, we are asking for a mighty movement of your Holy Spirit. A mighty movement, oh God, in our church and a mighty movement in Mulberry. Thank you for our city. Thank you for placing us here, we believe, for such a time as this. And yet, Lord, we know that what we can do in our city is extremely limited compared to what your Holy Spirit can do by changing and reordering people's hearts. We ask for that, God. We ask, Lord, for conversions. We ask, God, that you would give us boldness in sharing our faith. We ask, O oh Lord, that each one of our church leaders would be men who have Jesus ever on their hearts, the gospel ever on their lips, Lord God, who are eager to please you and, and, and want, to, uh, want to show the gratitude that they have because of your grace in their lives. Lord God, remind us every step we take that we are sinners saved by grace and only your grace, God. Unearned, undeserved, Lord, unprovoked, simply given. Lord, let the rest and the quiet and the repose of your grace fall on us tonight. And give us refreshment in your presence. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. My name is Lyle Caswell. I'm one of the pastors at Christ Community Presbyterian Church just right up the road. And so it's a real honor for me to be here tonight. Uh, celebrating this is worth to be marked. Um, I remember uh, growing up in my father's home. Uh, my father was a pastor, and so when we would get to church on Sunday mornings and the air wasn't exactly working great, he would pivot and he would say, open your Bibles to the book of Revelation. He saw it as an opportunity to kind of walk through some of the grave things that were happening. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay in my text in 1 Thessalonians. But Mark, it could have been an opportunity. So we're looking at the book of 1 Thessalonians. Um, just two verses, but we'll be looking at some other little bits in Thessalonians tonight. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. So I'd like you to listen very closely to the words that I'm about to read, because this is God's Word. i spoken to us, and so listen to it and give it its full due. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember you before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but this is the word of our Lord, it stands forever. Let's pray. Father, I would ask that your spirit would come and would fall upon this place, um, that you would give us what we read of Mary at the birth of your son, that she treasured these things in her heart. I pray that you would begin working um, at an imagination level, at a wonderment level in our hearts, that we could settle down for a little bit and just think of what you have done. Think of what you have done in greater hope, what you are doing and what you will do, and that we could just sit for a few moments together and just marvel at your power and might and grace. And so, Father, we pray that we would be with this time. Uh, encourage us from your word. We pray this for the sake of your glory and for the sake of our joy. In Christ we pray. Amen. So, when does it end is the name of the title, and not trying to be too catchy, but I kind of wanted to ask a question tonight, is tonight it? You know, is tonight the, the end of your work, of your labors, and of your endurance? I mean, tonight is particularization, right? We're running through the finish line. And I would say tonight is not the finish line. Tonight actually, in so many ways, is acting like a stabilization. 
Uh, the Lord has raised up leaders within your midst, and He's installing those leaders to give vision for the future, uh, to give hope for greater hope to go and get after it. So tonight is not the finish line. In fact, tonight is the celebration that we as a Presbytery, there are people here today from the Presbytery, and we're in a very Presbyterian way, marking this night as something that God has done. We really are celebrating. We are marking tonight as friends, as Christians, as brothers and sisters, that God is a great provider, uh, that God is gracious, that God has done stuff so far in this church that you can't explain in any other way, uh, but that he's done it. And so tonight we want to sit together and just be excited by that, be encouraged by that, uh, have our faith built by that as we think about the future. That's a little of what I think uh, Paul is doing in 1 Thessalonians, is he's getting excited about what God is doing um, in a church. Uh, Paul got a, uh, if you look at chapter 3, verse 6, he got some report from uh, Timothy, and the report got to Paul. And he says, you've got to be thinking about this, this church in Thessalonica. There's so much to be thankful for. Uh, their work is being, pro is being produced um, by faith. Their labors are being prompted by love. Their endurance is being inspired uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ. There's something really cool going on here, and I just want you to know it, Paul. And that's what's so much fun about verses 2 and 3. Paul says that I can't stop praying. And when I pray and I think about you, thanksgiving is what pours out of my heart. I just get so excited thinking about God working in and through you, doing things at the church that nobody else could have done but him. And so when I think, of, now just think about this. He says, when I remember you before God, when he's praying for them, this is what bubbles up. His excitement for what God is doing in and through them. And in many ways, that's what we're doing tonight. I get reports, not written ones, but verbal ones from Stan. We go to lunch from time to time at Tapatio's. And we talk about answers to prayer. We talk about what God's doing here at Greater Hope. And the work that y'all are up to, the labors that y'all are about, and the endurance that is required for you to get to tonight. And so in some ways, I'm standing before you giving thanks to God. Because God's done some really cool things here. And when it's worth celebrating now. Paul does keep writing the book, though. He keeps writing the book, and I'm so excited. I'm getting all kinds of thanksgiving for you because of the, the work and the love and the endurance that I see. But this is he, he keeps saying this through 1 Thessalonians, stay the course. In fact, when you get to the very end of the book, in chapter 5, verse 8, I love this. He says, but since we belong to the dead, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Same three words, right? For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's almost like he's saying that church planting is like a war. That is hard and that is difficult and that we got to suit up. And so he is saying in verse 11, I want you guys to keep encouraging one another with these words. Y'all done it. I want you to keep doing it with these words of this. Jesus is coming back. The victory is secured. And so let that day break into this day to produce a godly life. A sober one that looks to the future and says, that's where we're going. So what does it mean to bring his kingdom now? And then Paul closes, I think, the book with arguably, I think it's the best benediction, but that's just preference totally. In verses 23 and 24, he says, May God himself, the God of peace, may he sanctify you through and through. May your whole body and soul and spirit be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, the one who calls you, he's faithful, and he will do it. And Paul is drawing on the certainty of the promise and the comfort of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He, he, he's the one who's called you. He's the one that's working sanctification in you. He's the one who will do it. And it's from the comfort of that, he says, stay the course. Let's keep, let's keep going. This is not a finish line. This is a beginning tonight. For us to begin to think about the work that we do, the labor that we do, the endurance that we do. May it really be motivated, right, by faith and love and hope in Jesus Christ, the blessed hope. So I tell you all that, about a little bit about the book of Thessalonians, really to ask you two questions tonight. Um, why do you do what you do for the church? Let me ask you another way. 
and the myriad ways that you get the gift of service here at Greater Hope. Why do you do it? What's underneath it? What's going on in your heart? Because there's a connection between the motive of the heart and the ability to endure, to get after it in labor, and to work hard for Jesus. There's something about the heart. So I just want to ask you that. Why do you do what you do? Secondly, so if the night's not the finish line, then what is it? When, when, is, when is the labor of love over? When, when is the work uh, over? Um, so I'm going to answer those two questions for us tonight. One is this. Why do you do what you do? You know, it's interesting about the encouragement, or I would just say it's a compliment. Can you imagine sitting in a church and uh, the reading of this letter, and it's about you, and you say, I'm just so thankful about your work that is produced by faith, that your labors that are uh, prompted by love and your endurance that is inspired by the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, I would just be sitting there with a smile on my face. But by Paul complimenting them and encouraging them with this, these three motives going on in the heart, this is what we know, that oftentimes that's not the case. And in the compliment to them, it begins to show that in our human hearts, even serving God in the church, our motives are not as noble as they ought to be. That faith sometimes is more our heart motive is sight. What can I accomplish with these two hands that I never have to pray to God? That I can be independent and I can do all this kind of fruit bearing myself. That the labor prompted by love becomes more of a labor prompted by obligation. I know what I should be doing and I feel so guilty that I'm not. So I'm going to go do it. Right? And that our endurance that is inspired by hope in the blessed love of Jesus Christ coming back again triumphantly. It can often be inspired or hope to carry on the grid is earthly successes and mile markers that we see within the church. I saw this trifecta working in my sinful heart. So if you're sitting there thinking, yeah, I struggle sometimes with the motives of why I serve, I would just say cheer up here in the host. You're, you're in the host of a lot of other people that if they're honest, they do too. Um, and me personally, I struggle mightily at times. This trifecta was going on in my heart. Um, early in my ministry, I remember a Saturday in the fall. And Saturdays in the fall at my house are marked by an event that happens on television at either 3.30, 12, or 7, and it's called the Georgia Bulldogs. There is a worship service that happens on Saturday before the one on Sunday. And so, when I, I don't even know what's going on in the rest of the world when those things are on. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm locked in. But at Christ Community, I pass for a bunch of jokesters and pranksters. And so invariably, at kickoff, every, every fall, I would get texts from congregants saying, my marriage is struggling with this intense counseling right now. While I'm in jail, you kind of have to bail me out. It's like right as the foot is going through the football, I'm getting texts. That's, now you know how to pray for me, right? So it was, a, it was a fall day, not unlike that, and I got a call right at kickoff. And I took the call. It was from a congregate, and on the other side, it was a lady that was crying. And she had just had a baby, and it was in the NIC unit, and she just said, my husband and I are falling apart up here. Could you come and pray for us? Now, I didn't say this, but in my mind, I'm thinking, you mean right now? <laughs> like at this moment, you're thinking now is a good time? You think Holy Spirit's working now? <laughs> So, of course I didn't say that. So I got in the car for myself. The work that I was about to do was not through the eyes of faith of seeing this as an opportunity. I saw it a little bit more of an obstacle to my joy than what I had ordinarily had planned for the rest of the day. My labor was not being prompted by love. It was more by obligation. And if I don't go up there, I'm going to be the meanest pastor in Polk County. Right? The word's going to get out. And my endurance to go up there, I had already made a plan in my head. We're going to do a 15 minute or And we're going to go in, lay hands on the child, say a prayer, and we're, we're in and out. We'll come. I got the second act. There's no doubt in my mind. So, right, that's what's stirring in my heart. And so I get in the car for myself. But when I got to the hospital and I opened the door, this couple fell in my arms crying. I know this is going to surprise some of you, but I started crying. I got a low dew point. And so I'm sitting there holding these two, and they're a mess. And you look in this room, and it was a private room, and you've got this tent over this baby that's just a little bigger than your hand. 
and there's tubes going everywhere. And it's, it's scary. It's very fearful. And so I'm sitting there, we're crying, we've got tissues going, but all of a sudden we just begin to pray. And I begin to open up the Bible and I just begin to share about the promises of Jesus and how amazing he is. I begin to talk about his faithfulness to covenant kids. I begin to talk about his grace and his might and he's a great healer. I mean, we just begin to marvel at some of the great stories that are in the Bible about how great Jesus is when you're down and you're low and he's present. We begin talking about him being the good shepherd and that, you know, the last promise before he checks out, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You're not an orphan. I'm with you. The spirit is inside of you. And we just begin to grab on to him for hope. You want to know what? I lost time. I spent over two hours with that family, and I had no idea I had done it. So when I walked back out in the hallway, the Holy Spirit slapped me in the back of the head. He said, kid, you see what I did there? Your heart was so hard. But I promised you that I would sanctify you through and through, that I would hold on to you, and your stoniness, your meanness, your selfishness is no, is no hill for me to climb. I could beat it, and I did. You had bad motives, you had a bad heart. But then when you got in there, you see what I did? I softened you. And you had so much fun in there, and you encouraged and you helped. And two hours, you lost time, son. That day has always meant something to me. Because I think, I have to say all the time, I have to hold my heart up before Jesus and say, why am I doing what I'm doing? Better hope, if you're going to have any fun in this thing, if there's going to be any adventure, if there's going to be any wonderment in what's God going to do next, and we're marking what he's done, what he is, what's he going to do in the future. If there's going to be any wonderment, if there's going to be any excitement, this is my challenge for you. You're going to have to get a prayer life. One that you're going to have to go to him all the time and hold your heart up and go, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I showing this in stories? Why, why am I doing all of this stuff at the church that I'm doing? Because you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying to you? It's not only exhausting to not have a motive of faith, hope, and love and squarely in Jesus Christ and living for him and not yourself. It's just, it, there's no fun in it. That there's no larger story. There's no excitement of what he could and would and can do. There, there's none of that operating. You're just staring at your belly button. And so I would say, we have hope. You don't have to get a prayer life where you have honest questions of the Lord and ask him. That's the second thing I would say. Is that you're going to start reading a lot of passages like John 10, when Jesus says, Ain't nobody taking my life from me. I'm willingly laying it down for the sheep. And you begin to just sit with the grandeur that I'm one of those. And you begin to marvel at his work and labor and endurance for you on the cross. And I tell you, it'll change you. And that is why you've got to sit with the Bible, you've got to let God talk to you. That's why we read the community Bible reading. We say, Christ, can you? I'm not sure what we do here at Greater Hope. Do we read the community Bible reading? We don't. We should. Maybe. <laughs> read the Bible. Because it is his clarion voice speaking into hearts, stony, stony hearts like mine and yours, to call us back in the game to forgive us of our sins and to, and to give us the hope and the faith and the love to labor. Okay? So why don't you do what you do? That's the first question. You know, we're doing okay. Secondly, what's the finish line? I mean, I, I talked a little bit tonight. It's kind of like a stabilization. It really kind of is. I mean, we're, we're, getting, we're ordaining leaders tonight that are going to help lead and guide and direct and love on you. And all of this kind of thing. We're stabilizing a little bit of the foundation so that it projects us into the future. This, it's a little bit of what's happening tonight. But as I said in the introduction, tonight's not the finish line. So then what is? I was contemplating this when I, this is this happened way early. This happened 18 years ago. I hadn't even started corporate worship yet. And my buddy Tim Rice and I were heading to Orlando to spend some time with Steve Childers to talk about church planting. And we ended up doing that at University Presbyterian Church where um, Mark Bates is the pastor. And so we're in there and we're getting training and we're getting skilled and making plans and you know what we're going to do when we plan our churches. I'm excited. So at the, at the end of the meeting, um, Mark is like a giddy middle schooler because they had just finished their building. And so he said, I want to show you the building. So Mark is walking us through the building, the auditorium, 
And I mean, she owned a sound system and lights, not as bright as they did. And I just looked at it and I said, you made it. He viscerally turned to me and he said, you never say that in my church again. Now I'm a sense of God. So then I'm like sitting there just kind of like, I knew what I said, so I shouldn't say that. I knew what I said. But then Mark goes on. He says, never ever say that you made it. Because if that aroma that we've crossed over the finish line because we've got this grand building, it'll kill the mission. It'll kill the heart. It'll kill hope. It'll kill faith. It'll kill love because we've done what we set out to do. And what was Mark saying? Mark was opening my eyes. I hadn't even started corporate worship yet. And I was thinking the finish line is once you get a building, that that has to be it. And that, that marks success. And I just want to do a little change here. Greater Hope had to buy their building and so did Christ's community. But there are other churches here tonight that had buildings given to them. <laughs> I'm not bitter about it. But I bring it up all the time, so I think there could be an issue. Right? So, but that's not the finish line, right? It is buying buildings. It's not getting 500 people or whatever that thing is. It's not even getting a cash position of three months of operating capital. All of those things are really cool goals, but that's not the finish line. That's not why we do what we do. Those things, and y'all, listen, y'all already got a building paid cash for it, and we got this really cool stuff in that, we've got some property, we're excited to develop that thing, but when we cut the ribbon on that and move into the new place, that's not the finish line. That, that's basically just a place where we're going to gather to get the mission done better, right? These things are really great goals, but they're just like Ebenezer's, right? Remember Samuel, right in the Old Testament, made the, the Ebenezer stone? So that when um, the Israelites would look at that thing, they would say, man, what a mighty God we have. He can beat up the Philistines. He's powerful. We can trust his promises. We can obey him just by looking at that stone. And in some ways, that's what we're doing tonight. We're putting down an Ebenezer, and we're saying, look at what God has done at greater hope. Look at the people that have come to know the Lord. Look at the people here that actually said, I want to be a member of Right? I mean, when we put our petition in, Freddie, if you read the names, half of them were fictitious. They weren't even people that were real. <laughs> Stan told me all of them were real on the petition. Right? All this that we see here, all this life that's happening, this is what we're after. It's not buildings, it's not cash, it's not those kinds of things. But we're marking what God has done in the past so that we look into the future with a little bit of hope. We begin to understand the finish line that he's talking about here in Thessalonians. He's coming back. And he's going to set a table before all of us. And you're going to eat the richest affair for free. And we're all going to sit around and we're going to tell stories. And we're going to marvel at his work. We're going to marvel at his labors. We're going to marvel at his endurance on the cross. And we're going to sit there and we're going to be so overjoyed with reality that were there, that he picked us and he saved us and he sanctified us and he held us to the end and we're at the table with Jesus. So somehow or another, Paul is wanting that day to break into this day and to fuel us and to inspire us and to prompt us that the service that we do is ordinary stuff. But think about it with me this way. I'm closing. That you're that even the, 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 the ordinary stuff, what if your eyes were tuned by faith and you begin the next time that you prepare a children's lesson for children's ministry and your eyes of faith begin to look at that greater commission stuff that we all do and you begin to go, what an opportunity. I get to go tell kids about Jesus that have probably never heard his name all week long and your eyes of faith begin to sparkle a little bit at the opportunity that you have to introduce Jesus to a kid. That, that our labors, that are difficult, that are prompted by love, in, the, in the, just the ordinary stuff of going sitting with your friend when they're sick or when they're down or they're low and they just got fired or whatever that thing is, and you just sit with them and you pray with them and you talk with them and you tell them how marvelous Christ is, not in platitudes, because you're crying out there with them. The labors of love, that you, t- you go to a community group and you show up so you can pray and read the Bible a little bit with each other, right? Labors of love and the ordinary stuff that you work up the courage to share the gospel with your neighbor. What if they came to Christ? What if your neighbor 
the one you like the least, you started praying for him or her to be her. And they came to Christ. How much fun would that be? Faith, love, and endurance. And I'll just say here, what if you got just the ordinary work of just showing up at church every Sunday? That you stop looking for better offers because you know there aren't better offers than coming and thinking well about Jesus on Sunday. That you get to sing songs and you get to hear prayers and you get to read the Bible together. You, you, you get to hear from catechisms from time to time. You get to hear sermons. You get benedictions said over you. And it enthralls your imagination to go, I got half that. But there's no way I'm going to be able to get after it and to endure. I've got to have somebody remind me each and every week who I am, what God thinks of me, and what he's done for me. So what would it be like for us to endure like that together? I don't know exactly how it would play out, but I think it would be a lot more fun. I think there would be some wonderment again. I think it's stand praying for the city of Mulberry. I and mean, how much fun is that to think about taking the city? So I stand before you tonight as a man whose heart is sunny and as cold as yours, and there's hope in Jesus. Isn't that great? So why don't we go to him, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray for just 30 seconds. I want to make it too weird. And pray yourself right out loud. But maybe where you got caught, maybe where your heart's a little harder than it should be, maybe your, your vision of what this thing's all about has gotten really small. And you're realizing that you're staring at the belly button. And we need to share to Jesus. So let's pray a little bit together. And we'll keep going. Lord, Father, I thank you so much that the work of producing faith, hope, and love in me is squarely on the Holy Spirit. Uh, that he is producing in me and making me more like Christ. And I thank you for that. I thank you that you would go through great lengths um, to get back to the people. That we can be humble and that we can be emboldened uh, because of the love that you have for us and the truth of the gospel. And so, Father, I pray for greater hope. I pray, Father, that you would use them and bless them, that they would treasure up in their hearts. They might actually take a, a moment or two after the service or tomorrow morning um, and just think about what you've done and how great you have been and you are and how, what you're going to be and that the blessed hope of the return of your son will break into this day and bring some excitement and bring some wonderment and bring some real work, real labor, uh, real uh, grit, uh, Father, that we can get after it that we can work together to see this county change. And so, Father, come. Come by your Spirit and fall on this church. Use them mightily so that more people in this county can come to worship you because you deserve it. Father, do this for the sake of your glory and for the sake of our joy. We pray this through Christ. Amen. Thank you, Lyle. Uh, after, uh, we're going to collect an offering at this time, so ushers, if you uh, would come forward. Uh, we're going to actually pass the plates. It's been a while since we've done that. We haven't even been doing that uh, at our regular service, so if it's a little awkward, we may have forgotten how to do it, uh, but we're going to do that tonight. Uh, please ge give generously tonight. Um, we are, uh, as a church, as those of you who are regulars know, we're raising money for our building uh, projects. Uh, we have uh, been blessed, as, as Lyle alluded to, with a building just down the road. If you've never seen it, I'd encourage you to go down Fifth Avenue, and you can see that uh, building down towards 37 on the right-hand side. Um, we've also acquired property right across the street. We're uh, getting ready, we're praying and planning in that stage of building a, a new and bigger facility. So uh, please give uh, generously tonight. Uh, after the offering, uh, we're going to kind of transition into a basically a presbytery meeting, and uh, there's going to be some things that you may have never witnessed before or seen. We're going to ordain some officers, uh, and so now as we uh, collect the offering, you might want to look ahead a little bit in the bulletin. You can kind of see some of the uh, proceedings that are going to be ahead. We're very excited. Let's get generously.
Jonathan, I've had the privilege of, of serving on the <clears throat> temporary session for Stan uh, for the last few months. And myself and uh, Gary Brickhouse and Mike Sly, other names are there uh, in the front uh, of the uh, worship folder here. And we are transitioning to a presbytery uh, meeting of sorts because what, what has to happen is we have a commission. The commission's uh, names are there on the first page. So we have three teaching elders or pastors and then three ruling elders. Uh, and these are from various uh, churches in our presbytery. Uh, and you guys have had a long road to this point uh, because you started out meeting here. Uh, and then, well, COVID happened. Threw us, threw, threw us all up a curveball. Uh, and then the Lord opened up the opportunity to buy the property that you're, you're currently in, started a meeting there, and worship services, more worship services. Uh, and then as momentum grows, the process is that the church petitions Presbytery to become a particular church. We have two kinds of churches in the PCA, okay? Mission churches and particular churches. And the only difference is one uh, is um, self-governing and the other is not. So when you're a mission church, you have to have help governing, which is why myself and Gary and Mike have been serving alongside Stan as a temporary session from the Presbytery. But then you reach a point where you all elect, choose as the Spirit moves elders and deacons among you, uh, and then you petition Presbytery and you say, we want to we be our own thing. Uh, and real names actually have to be used, and real people have to actually sign that petition. So I learned tonight that Christ Community is not a particular church. Uh, and we will have a, a particularization service for a while, and hopefully within the next six to 12 months. It's up to him as to, he's already got officers. Apparently they've been ordained by somebody. I'm not really sure what's going on over there, but that's a different story. Thank you for doing it by the book in the right way, okay? But anyway, uh, as you'll see here, there are a number of questions that get answered or get uh, asked, and they're vows, they're not just questions. So these are significant questions, significant words, significant things that you and the men among you who are uh, elders and deacons and stand are saying yes to. Uh, but the first thing that we do, as you'll see there, is uh, we establish a covenant uh, as a group of people. So those of you who have joined Greater Hope, you're actually not part of Greater Hope. You're part, technically, of the Presbyterian Church in America. So you're members of the denomination because there's no particular church for you to belong to until now. So this, this is a very uh, exciting and fun thing uh, to get to do, but it's also sobering because you'll see the word covenant there, right? And any time a covenant is made in the Bible, it's a big deal. It's a serious thing uh, because it is you giving your word. So uh, I'm going to ask this question of those who are members of Greater Hope, and I think it would be appropriate if you would stand uh, as we ask this question of you, okay? So you're a member of Greater Hope. Uh, please stand with me here and let me ask you this question. Do you, in reliance on God for strength, solemnly promise and covenant that you will walk together as a particular church on the principles of the faith and order of the Presbyterian Church in America, and that you will be zealous and faithful in maintaining the purity and peace of the whole body? Do you? Amen. Amen. And so, now I get to pronounce and declare that you are constituted a church according to the Word of God and the faith and order of the Presbyterian Church in America. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I think it would be a perfect time to call. Thank you, Steve. As a particular church, you can ordain or we can ordain and install uh, for you, and in the future, your session, your elders will ordain and install uh, elders and deacons. So you have to have those who are officers, uh, rulers, leaders in the church to govern yourselves. So first we're going to do uh, the ruling elders, and Stan, do you want them to come stand up here? Okay, so ruling elder guys, if you would come stand up here in the, in the front row. So we've got Ben and Ryan and Clark and Clint. 
You guys remember me? Okay. Just, just check it. You've seen me before. So guys, these are uh, six ordination and installation vows, and then we will have one for the congregation. Do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as originally given to be the inerrant word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice? Good. If you want to say I do, that's the right answer. Okay. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the confession of faith and the catechisms of this church as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures? And do you further promise that if at any time you find yourself out of accord with any of the fundamentals of this system of doctrine, you will, on your own initiative, make known to your session the change which has taken place in your views since the assumption of this ordination vow? Third, do you approve of the form of government and discipline of the Presbyterian Church in America in conformity with the general principles of biblical polity? Do you accept the office of ruling elder in this church and promise faithfully to perform all the duties thereof and to endeavor by the grace of God to adorn the profession of the gospel in your life and to set a worthy example before the church of which God has made you an officer? Fifth, do you promise subjection to your brethren in the Lord? And lastly, do you promise to strive for the purity, peace, unity, and edification of the church? Great. And for the congregation, do you, the members of Greater Hope, acknowledge and receive these brothers as ruling elders? And do you promise to yield them all that honor, encouragement, and obedience in the Lord to which his office, according to the word of God and the constitution of this church, entitles him? Do you? Great. Guys, if you'll have a seat, uh, and then the deacons. So the deacons, if you would come on up. So we've got Danny and Bob. I'm really trying to remember your names as I do this, so this is just more for me than for you. Danny, Bob, Robert, and John. And everybody knows that Robert is Stan's brother, right? Yeah, I just want to point that out. I think that's pretty cool. God has been faithful to the McMahon family. We want to rejoice in that. Deacons, these are your vows. Do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as originally given to be the inerrant word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice? Second, do you receive, excuse me, do you sincerely receive and adopt the confession of faith and the catechisms of this church as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures? And do you further promise that at any time you find yourself out of accord with any of the fundamentals of this system of doctrine, you will, on your own initiative, make known to your session the change which has taken place in your views since the assumption of this ordination? Thirdly, do you approve of the form of government and discipline of the Presbyterian Church in America in conformity with the general principles of biblical polity? Do you, John? Okay, cool. <laughs> this is like the flight attendant and you're sitting in the exit row. I need a verbal yes. Okay? <laughs> verbal yes. Verbal I do, or else we can't we can't go through it. We're gonna have to, the trap door is gonna open you're gonna out the trap door. Okay, fourth, do you accept the office of deacon in this church and promise faithfully to perform all the duties thereof and to endeavor by the grace of God to adorn the profession of the gospel in your life and to set a worthy example before the church of which God has made you an officer. Great. Fifth, do you promise subjection to your brethren in the Lord? And lastly, do you promise to strive for the purity, peace, unity, and edification of the church? For the congregation, do you, the members of Greater Hope, acknowledge and receive these brothers as deacons? And do you promise to yield them all that honor, encouragement, and obedience in the Lord, to which his office, according to the word of God and the constitution of this church, entitles him? Great. I'm going to ask uh, Gary Brickhouse and Mike Slide to come on up to uh, this podium here. And uh, elders and deacons, if you would, we're going to have them kneel, right? So just up front here. And I would invite any ordained uh, elder in the Presbyterian Church in America to come on up and gather around these brothers as we lay hands on them. And Gary and Mike pray for them. Okay. So just maybe just in front of them, where Gary and Mike are, please.
pray. Father, we are grateful. Uh, you've heard it said so much already this evening. Your goodness and your kindness to this church. How you have been faithful again and again. And Lord, these men in front of us um, are no different. They are a gift and a sign of your favor and kindness to this church body. Lord, I think this is your design. You did not design your church to be led by stand alone, to solely share the burden of shepherding and service. You have instituted these offices of elder and deacon to help shepherd and to operate in the gifts of mercy. And so, Lord, we thank you. We acknowledge that this is a tangible sign of your kindness. So we thank you for that. Lord, I pray for these men. Lord, I pray that they would grow in their love for you, that they would grow in their love for the local church, and through their various jobs and responsibilities of shepherding and mercy ministries, Father, that that would ultimately be as Lyle preached, Lord, that that's our underlying motive is a desire to demonstrate your love for us. So I pray that you would help them there, Father. Lord, I pray that they are gifted, talented men. <laughs> and that's why they're, that's, that's the way that you have created them. And Lord, I know how easy it is for me and others to rely on our own strength. And so Lord, I pray that these men would not do that. I pray that they would not rely on their strength, but they would look to you. That they would find their strength in you. And again, as Lyle said, the, the journey has just started. It's just beginning. And so, Lord, as the road continues and it gets hard and there are tough days and their strength is gone, Lord, that they'll look to you. They'll find their strength. They'll find their hope. They'll find their rest in you. And Lord, finally, I, I pray that you would equip them that you would equip them for the fight that's ahead, that you would equip them for the journey. Lord, that you would wrap them in wisdom to lead, wisdom to help make decisions. Lord, that you would wrap them in humility, that they would think of themselves as less than others. Father, I pray that you would wrap them in your protection for both them personally and their families. Father, it is a tough road and a tough journey and a tough calling. So I'm grateful and thankful for their courage. And Lord, we know that these men can move forward, that this church can move forward, ultimately rooted in your great hope. And may that be abundant and on display more than anything. Father, that the hope for them personally, the hope for them as officers of this church, and the hope for this church itself is not rooted in their gifts and talents, but it's rooted in you. And may they make a mark on this community. May this community know, Father, that they have encountered Jesus, the love of Jesus, through this local church and through these men. We give you the honor and the praise and the glory for how you're going to use them. Father, we thank you tonight for Ben and Ryan and Clark and Clint and the praise. They assume the meal of being an elder in your church, that you would enable them to shepherd liberty, that you would give them discernment in applying the scripture to life situations in their own life and the lives of those that they desire to shepherd in the corporate life of the church and in individual lives. Praise you give them patience and diligence as they um, shepherd sheep from time to time that tend to wander. Pray that you make them in a prayer, that they would be deeply in prayer for the priest's Lord, grant them holiness of life. We pray for John and Danny and Robert and Bob as they assume responsibility as deacons in your church. And we pray that they would serve with compassion 
that they would be affected in facilitating the conditions that bring about effective corporate worship in the church and service and ministry in the community, helping to care for the congregation, well, the walking holiness of life. And as they look after many of the things that might seem to be mundane about buildings and facilities and budgets and stuff, that you would give them grace and help them to see the, the part that that plays in your kingdom. So I pray that you would help them to exercise their service with conviction and compassion, that you would protect their families, that you would help them to serve with clarity and unity and loyalty to one another, to Christ, and to the church. I pray that they would do all this with a sense of wonderment that we've heard about tonight. Looking to see what you're going to do next. And we pray that you would grant them a great harvest in their work. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So guys, a few <clears throat> officers, that is, uh, elders and deacons, if you would, after you've done all the right-handed kind of fellowshipping, stand up here in a line for me. And we'll stand up here for as we have to do
with all our mind, with all our strength, and do as much good as we can for as many people as we can for as long as we can. So the greatest thing that I can do ever is for you to leave my presence attached and aware of what Holy Spirit wants for you. That may be something I said. Odds are, it isn't. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to be here, and we pray that you would uh, continue to attend this service. And you would be great for us and encourage us in our work. In Jesus' name, amen. Dean, I got five minutes. Would you start your uh, clock back there? I got between five and seven, and I figure if you give me the five minute mark, I can get done. On your prayer card, on my Greater Hope prayer card, I have three passages that I think about that I'd like to tell you the verses, and then I'd like to tell you four stories from when I was 6, 10, 17, and 19. Ephesians 5, 1, therefore be imitators of God, as beloved children, walk in love. Then you drop down at about verse 21, I think, and it says, submit to each other in reverence to the Lord. So I'm to charge the elders in the congregation and the way God has designed for you to bear witness, to evangelize Mulberry and the world is for you to imitate God. And he says, this is how you, finites, imitate the infinite, submit to each other. Bill Bass, our friend, gave me the definition of submission. It is simply to understand your mission as a part of a larger mission. Be submitted to a larger role. So how does an authority and a subordinate submit to each other? Then the third verse is out of 2 Corinthians 8. And it says, of this group of people, they first gave themselves to the Lord and then by God's will to us. So we must first give ourselves to the Lord either in the subordinate or the authority role, and then by God's will to others. Six years old, in every story I tell about my mother, always know that she's the authority on the subordinate. <clears throat> 3.15, it was 3.15, you always knew it was 3.15 when she would make this announcement that she had just topped off the trash can, and she would announce, Timothy Oliver, Come take out the trash can right in the middle of Gilligan's Island. <laughs> what in the world was the Holy Spirit doing? Moving my mother, filling up that trash can from the preordained eternity past right at the time when Gilligan was in trouble. It was so I could learn how to obey. Obedience. Think of what you think that word means. And let me tell you what it is for us. For a Christian, obedience is to have someone ask us to do something that we didn't plan on doing. <clears throat> it's not obedience for my wife to yell at me to go eat a large deep pan pizza. I do that on my own. To love the sound of the voice of the person who asks. To love the chore that we get to ask to do because it breaks in on our agenda and we have to set aside our lives to do what someone else has asked to do. To do it in such a way that the person that we serve as a result of being asked loves the person who asks us and doesn't notice us. And that God smiles on the whole thing. So my mother, this marvelous authority, responding to the unction of the Holy Spirit, asked me right in the wrong time, which is the right time for me as a six-year-old to learn what it means to obey, to love the sound of my mother's voice, to participate in the community of our home, and do my chores to the glory of God. I never did it, but that was the goal. That was authority to a subordinate, subordinate to an authority. Ten years old, Coach Harvey discerned that it was God's will that we have practice at 4.30. Mom, it's 
subordinate. Time to take you to baseball practice. Cusses. Now, when my mom said to me, Timothy Oliver, time to take out the trash, I responded to her, my heart, I don't want to take out the trash. She responded, you can take out the trash with a good attitude or take out the trash with a bad attitude, but the trash is going out. She knew that I, did, I couldn't grasp all the beauty of obedience at six that I would grasp later when I turned 60. But as a subordinate, I said, Mom, it's time for you to take me to baseball practice. And she was just in the middle of doing something great for someone else. And so she said, cusses. Because it was an opportunity for her to pay the authority of her life, which was my father, who thought it was a good design that I play on a baseball team. And somebody was telling me what to do. You get it? These elders are going to ask you to do stuff at the wrong time when it interrupts your life. These, your friends, are going to ask for help at the wrong time, and it's going to interrupt your life. And my mom is going to get us where we need to be. I was walking across the yard, 17 years old, third out of three, third out of four stories. 17, my, I'm complaining about something. My dad grabs me, takes two steps in front of me, grabs me, looks... Be right in the, probably right here, <laughs> wherever that is, in my college room. Timothy Oliver, don't ever sin against God by not loving being you. And don't ever sin against God by not loving the chores he's given. Congregants, these, especially that one, is your chore. And your chore is to help them love you as their chore. Freshman year, I'm 19 years old. My mom had one goal for us, and that's that we could make our beds. I had three brothers, I had three brothers. She was not a failure. But at 19, I yell at my mother on Christmas. Mom, I made my bed for you today. Just knew everyone was there having dinner, breakfast. It was great. She was going to say something nice about me. That's sad. <laughs> sad. Why is that sad? Timothy Oliver, if you make your bed for me, you'll only make your bed while I'm around. You make your bed for the Lord. You make it every day. What was acceptable at six years old, taking out the trash with a bad attitude, was repulsive to my mother at 19. Give yourself to the Lord. And then love your children. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be us. And we thank you for your church. We thank you that authorities have to submit to the needs of the subordinates, and subordinates have to submit to the needs of the authority. What a love affair is on display here in Mulberry. This grand presentation of prayer. We love you. So we have to install and ordain uh, officers, but we have to install Stan. So Stan's already been ordained. At least I hope that there weren't fake names on your ordination, uh, whatever it is like that. But, uh, we get to install him, and uh, this, this brother, as he said at the beginning, has been dreaming about and desiring this for a long time. And I have a, a small little piece of mulberry from my sister-in-law, Ms. Kuhn, uh, your typing teacher. Um, and uh, Mulberry is, is uh, so it's, it's a little bit of a connection there. So it's just really neat that guys do this. So Stan, uh, I'm going to ask you uh, some installation vows and then congregation, some questions for you as well. Are you now willing to stand to take charge of this congregation as their pastor, agreeable to your declaration, 
and accepting its call. Do you conscientiously believe and declare, as far as you know your own heart, that in taking upon you this charge, you are influenced by a sincere desire to promote the glory of God and the good of His church? Thirdly, do you solemnly promise that by the assistance of the grace of God, you will endeavor faithfully to discharge all the duties of a pastor to this congregation and will be careful to maintain a deportment in all respects, becoming a minister of the gospel of Christ, agreeable to your ordination engagements. Amen. So for you, members of Greater Hope, do you, the people of this congregation, continue to profess your readiness to receive, receive Stan McMahon, whom you have called to be your pastor? Secondly, do you promise to receive the word of truth from his mouth with meekness and love and to submit to him in the due exercise of discipline? Thirdly, do you promise to encourage him in his labors and to assist his endeavors for your instruction and spiritual edification? Lastly, do you engage to continue to him while he is your pastor that competent worldly maintenance, that means you'll pay him, uh, which you have promised? and to furnish him with whatever you may see needful for the honor of religion and for his comfort among you. Amen. So, Stan, I now pronounce and declare that you, Stan McMahon, have been regularly elected and installed pastor of this congregation, agreeable to the word of God, and according to the Constitution of the Presbyterian Church in America, and that, as such, he is entitled to all support, encouragement, honor, and obedience in the Lord, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, this is ghost there, sorry, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Uh, Gary and Mike are going to come up and uh, pray, and I would ask uh, newly minted officers, uh, as well as any other elders in the PCA, to come on up here, and uh, Stan's going to kneel. We're going to lay hands on Stan uh, and pray for him. And then Drew's going to come and charge him. Let's pray. Once again, Lord, we start by thanking you for your kindness. Lord, I thank you that somewhere along the way, you had, had Stan realize the gifts and talents that you had given him, and that those were intersected with a love for you, and a love for your kingdom, and a love to teach your word. And so I thank you for years, Lord, that you have led Stan to pursue what it means to shepherd, what it means to be a lover of your word, to give himself to study and to the gift of teaching. Father, we thank you for that. And we thank you that we stand here today based on a vision that you gave him for this city. And Lord, that you gave him courage to step out and to move forward. And as he already mentioned this evening, it hasn't all been roses. There have been already ample curveballs thrown his way. And Lord, it was you who sustained him. It was his faith in you. It was his understanding of the calling that you had put on him for this time and for this place. And so, Lord, as we mark this day with the particularization of this church and with the installation of elders and deacons, and he is a pastor here, Lord, Father, those prayers don't really change. Father, we pray that he would still be a man that's marked by courage, a man who is willing to step out in faith and to lead and to guide and direct where it may feel uncomfortable. Father, I pray that you would continue to give him a vision for your local church, a vision for greater hope, a vision for the gospel impacting the city of Mulberry. Father, I pray that you would give him endurance to run the race. In some ways, it feels like this has been a journey that's been going for a bit. But as we've already said, we're, we're at the beginning. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give him strength to run the race. 
Father, Lord, I pray that you would just continue to instill in him a love for you, a love for your word, a love for his family, and a love for his people, for your people that you've put around him. Father, all to promote the glory of God in this city and through this church. And Lord, it won't happen because Stan's good enough. It won't happen because he's so eloquent in his teaching. It won't happen because he follows all the rules of the BCO. It's going to happen, Lord, because you did it. Because you are moving in and around and through his church. And may he never lose sight of that. And may all the praise and all the glory and all the honor be to you alone. Well, we give thanks for the way you have gifted your church, and we thank you for the good gift of stand to these folks here in Mulberry. We pray that you would enable him to fulfill his vows and his calling, and you would grant him holiness of life, and he would grow as a man of prayer, that you would give him resilience and wisdom, that you would enable him to bring Jesus to people, but not to try to be Jesus, which is a temptation for many of us from time to time. Pray that he would have the joy and exhilaration of opportunities to teach and to preach, but also that he would have the resilience and perseverance in the many hours of private study that it takes to do the uh, public part effectively. So give him grace in those hours of study when sometimes things can feel dry, that he would warm his heart and that the word to him would be alive and fresh and personal and tender to him a day by day in his private study and preparation. Pray that you would send Stacy in the home and the children, that they would uh, grow up viewing being a preacher's kid as a privilege and an honor, and that you would uh, grant them your blessing on their family, and that you would bless them in every way. We uh, pray for your continued uh, care and development and growth of this good gift that you have given your church. And we thank you for him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So my name is Drew Bennett. I pastor uh, Redeemer uh, PCA Church in Winterhaven, Florida. Uh, I've also, for the last number of years, been directing our efforts as a church planting network here in Polk County with Rudy Polk and also the Florida Church Planting Network across the state. And I just want to say, all well, the churches that uh, you're seeing planted in all the places in Florida, I boast about you so often because I love the work that God is doing here so much. I, in 2008, planted a church in my hometown. Uh, we met for the first year in the auditorium of the high school that I graduated from. If that sounds familiar, uh, we did. We were, we were praying for a while. He's still bitter all these years later that we were gifted in the facility. <laughs> we were only there for a year. Uh, and I just love, I love so much uh, Stan's desire to go back to the place uh, where he was from and to plant. Because who else? Who else would God call to? And yet we get to rejoice in this great gospel work he's doing here in the city. And I just, I just give thanks to him for that. I gave up on the coat, uh, and I'm going to get very brief because it is one of them here uh, for a minute. But here's what I, I want to say. Um, pastors can't speak for themselves. They can't talk about what it feels like to be a pastor because it feels too self-serving. And so I'm glad for this opportunity to briefly talk to Stan about the work of pastoring, but also to talk for him, to you, 
the church that he's pastoring about how it feels to do that work so that you might make it a joy and not full of groaning for him as the Hebrews writer put it. Because you will profit spiritually from his joy in pastoring you. So my text for this charge is from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 11 through 13, and then 2 Corinthians 7, verse 2. This came to mind as we read in community Bible reading. Some of our churches are reading the Bible together. And uh, as we read, I just, I just thought, yes, that's, what, that's where the Lord would have me go. Here's what Paul writes to the Corinthians. He says, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also to us. And then he comes back to the same theme later in the next chapter. Chapter 7, verse 2, where it says, Make room in your hearts for us. So, 2 Corinthians is a letter that was written by a pastor who had been hurt by a church that he had hurt. And that is going to happen to you as well. Stand despite your best efforts and intentions, you are going to hurt people for your hope. Paul didn't set out to hurt his friends in Corinth, just the opposite. He was trying to help, and yet he hurt them all the same. And that is, quite honestly, One of the hardest parts of pastoral ministry for me, the unintended pain pastors can cause when they fail because of their pride or cowardice, even when they do the right thing, but in the wrong way. Pastors are sinners, after all. Can I get an amen on that? They are shepherds, but let's not forget that they also are sheep. And so, Stan, it's just going to happen, but church, you're going to hurt your pastor. And I love Stan and Stacey and their family, and I don't want them to be be hurt, I don't want to see them hurt, but there is no other way. There is just no other way. Pastors complete what is lacking in Christ's suffering, in their own suffering, love for the church. That is the call. That's the call. To make Christ's love for the church concrete in the love the pastor shows to his people. I've never quite been able to get away from C.S. Lewis's profound insight that to love is to be vulnerable. I keep circling back because it is just so much on the concrete of my life as a pastor every day that there are only two options. You can choose love and have your heart broken or you can lock it away and keep it from getting hurt and become unbreakable. Those are really the only two choices that you have. The root of the word vulnerable means to be woundable, to make yourself woundable. And so the choice to love is the conscious decision to keep showing up to get your heart broken. Over and over again. As hard as that might be, as hard as it might sound, as dreary as the outlook on that might be, that is the assignment for pastor and church towards one another to keep showing up to get your heart broken. And as hard as it might sound, the opposite is much, much worse. To be safe, to be loveless, to lock yourself away, those things are the same. To be safe, to be loveless, if that's the case, you already have one foot in hell. The relationship between a pastor and his church is based upon spiritual authority, but even more so, love. The pastor modeled by Paul here holds his people in his heart, and they hold him in theirs. The pastor gives his heart, his very heart, to his people. He makes himself woundable to them, and they give their hearts away to him in return. And it's not a safe investment. It's a risk. Which is why we formalize that relationship with a commitment ceremony, with vows, and commitments so that in the moment, sometime in the future, hopefully distant, but maybe near future, when in fact this has happened and you've hurt one another, pastor and church, and you're tempted in that moment to shut your heart off, that instead you might find the grace and the remembrance of the commitments you've made to one another to not shut your heart off, but to open it even wider to one another. To be gracious and forgiving, and in that act of obedience, to go on to find renewed strength and result to keep showing up for a broken heart. Because there is no other way to live together as sinners in a fallen world. So my charge to you is just this. Open your hearts wide to one another. And keep them open. Adjust your expectations. Decide right now not to be surprised when you hurt one another. So when, that when it happens, you can keep going with one another and not give up. Stand. There will be times when it feels like you're doing all the work and no one else is doing any and it's not being reciprocated and you'll have people tell you that it's all your fault when it's not, when it's actually theirs. And the lack, even as Paul says here, is from their side, not yours. 
And here's what you gotta do. You gotta you can't let the unevenness between what you're giving and what you're getting in return to make you bitter or from you gotta keep your heart wide open to the church. In church, greater hope there will be times when Stan will get it wrong. And even more times when he'll be touchy and insecure and defensive, just like Paul was, and that's my favorite part of Second Corinthians, is to see Paul just processing out loud. He's a complete mess. And Stan's going to be like that too. And when he is, keep your heart wide open to him. Cover his sins and his shortcomings with your love. Consider whether you might make up for whatever disappointment or hurt you feel, not by demanding more of him, but by fixing whatever lack there may be in your own affection. Well, one more thing. Paul goes first. And Stan, being a pastor means that you will often have to go first too. In the middle of this exhortation, Paul says parenthetically, he says, I speak to you, I speak as to children. You might rush right by it, but it's important. He echoed the same language a few chapters later, explaining why he chose not to receive financial support from the Corinthian church, so that they would know that he loved them and wasn't just using them to further his goal. So he says, I seek not what is yours, but you. Yes, pastors in the people business. And he, here's what he says in verse 14. For children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but the parents for their children. And so I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Paul here reminds us that we as pastors are fathers and the church are spiritual children. And we spend and are spent for their souls, not the other way around. And that is why you, Stan, cannot source your love for these people in their love and care for you. If you do, you're setting yourself up for bitter disappointment. And church, Stan's record of faithfulness and love for you cannot be the cause of your love for him because he is not the Christ. He is not the Christ. Stan, you're not the Christ. He is your shepherd, but he is not the shepherd. Please remember that. And so the only way, the only way for you to open your hearts and to keep them wide open to one another throughout all of the years of ministry God might give you is, as pastor and church, for you to be, all of you, living from the first-hand experience of God's wide open heart for you in Jesus Christ. As we've already said, it's his love that fuels the love between pastor and church. He, our Savior, he made himself for you. He made himself one. And by his wounds, we are healed. Amen. God bless you. We love you. We love you. We love your family. We're praying for you all. We're so excited to have you in front of you. Let's close uh, our song of response as the church is one foundation, just affirming that uh, all our hope is not in us, but that our church is founded on Jesus Christ and not in us. Please stand with us as we worship.
My heart is full, but my body is hot. So I'm only going to say a few words. Uh, I love y'all with all of my heart, and uh, I can't think of a better group of people to follow Jesus with than y'all. And so thanks for putting up with me and uh, having me stay your pastor. Yeah. I'm excited about that. So let's receive tonight. Thank you. Yeah. Now, don't forget to light, light refreshments out in the lobby. Please help yourself. There's room on the porch as well to gather. Uh, if your faith is in Christ, please receive tonight the blessing of the benediction. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in his hope tonight.